Okay, everyone. Uh, well, we are in for a real treat right now because we all know him and love him. Uh, Jason Bowden is going to uh, share some time and talk with us this morning. Uh, Jason, do you need me to share my screen or are you able to share the, uh, uh, your uh, PowerPoint presentation you've created? Yep, I can, I can share mine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, and let me just get this up for presentation. All right, so this session, uh, we'll be spending about the next half hour just covering an overview of the remote teaching uh, expectations and recommendations. And really to echo Cindy, I guess I should lead off with first, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you for sticking this out and thank you for all the work that you're putting into this. Obviously, these are, are strange and frightening, frankly, times uh, and, and unprecedented. And know that everything you're doing is appreciated and you'll see this again later on in the presentation, but be kind to yourself and know that your expertise will carry you uh, and not everything will be perfect and it doesn't have to be. We're really kind of going back to, to basics in a lot of ways for making this transition work and that will be beneficial to our students as we go through this. So just a little bit of background uh, without the, I mean, you're all probably aware of the, the COVID-19 specific information. Uh, so more of a, a student focused background and why we are making the recommendations that we are uh, in conjunction with academic affairs. So many students have expressed that they feel the need for synchronous class meetings to be successful. And to echo what Cindy said, it should be emphasized, this doesn't necessarily mean synchronous lecture. Right, what our students have been explaining is that they feel they need to have that time to interact with you, with their faculty member, in order to get support. They need that live. They say that's why they didn't take necessarily an online class. They want that, that interaction. Uh, they may need to be able to interact with their peers. Be mindful that social distancing is a thing. So with those synchronous sessions, not only are you providing them access to yourself, but you're also providing them with that sense of community that they're going to be missing when the class session is not available. Uh, what form that takes is again, up to you, you're the experts. Uh, is, that a, is that a live lecture? It can be. Is that a, a class discussion? It can be. Are they full sessions? Maybe. Are they short sessions? Sure. Uh, really, it's, it's, it's completely flexible and up to you, but it's those touch point moments that our students are looking for. Uh, remember, just like some of us, Many of our students will not be familiar with Brightspace or with Zoom. This is a new world for everyone. Uh, our student population will deeply feel the economic and traumatic effects of this pandemic. Uh, Non-essential businesses are now closed. Many of our students will have changing schedules. Uh, many of them are facing uncertainty with their employment and with their home life. So just like all of us are feeling this, they are too. Uh, and, and just a, a reminder that in a traumatic event, consistency and simplicity are key in chaotic times. There's a lot that's unknown, there's a lot that's changing, there's a lot that's kind of fluid. So the more we can provide simple and consistent experiences for students, it gives them that, that thing to hang on to. It gives them something they can predict and something that we can help them control. So a, a basic plan for remote teaching, and Cindy already touched on this, so we'll be moving quickly through some of these slides. Uh, synchronous activities will be in Zoom. Uh, if you have another tool that you prefer, please use Zoom instead, at least in the, the time being. This is because for our students, think of it as learning one thing instead of having to learn two to five things to get the information that you need. So again, that reliability and that consistency and that simplicity, the more we can take off them to have to learn in addition to your course content, the easier it will be for them to focus on those outcomes and meeting them. These should occur at class meeting times because that's when the students have scheduled. As people have already rightly pointed out in chat, uh, this is subject to change for our students. They, their schedules may shift and likely will. So they may not always be able to attend on time, uh, but we should be available at the time that they anticipate that we will be available. This also allows students, again, that opportunity to talk live with faculty and peers. And again, just to make sure I'm, I'm never not reinforcing this, you are the experts in this. So just like you would in your regular face-to-face -face class sessions, do what you need to do to, to meet those outcomes and to support your students. If, it, if it's lecture, do that. If you wanna hold conferences, do that. 
but make sure that those expectations are communicated clearly and consistently as well. For the asynchronous portions, the assignment collection quizzes and grading, we're conducting this through Brightspace, again, so that we can keep this consistent. Uh, for some of you though, you have courses that use a third party assessment platform. We're not asking you to change that, right? That, that's sometimes in the 335 or it's a convention of the course, your students are used to it. So use your judgment uh, in, in how you're setting this up. But I would recommend if you're not using something already, go with Brightspace, because again, that's one less thing that your students will have to learn. Just briefly touching on those structural, again, reinforcing synchronous and Zoom. Uh, also, all remote instruction courses will use the news widget. Don't be afraid of the word widget. It's a weird word for a very straightforward um, item on, on Brightspace. Uh, so use the news widget in Brightspace to convey critical class information. That doesn't mean you can't email your students. It doesn't mean you can't use other methods uh, if you already do to notify them but make sure that that news widget is on your homepage and that you are using it. It does support text. It's nothing fancy. It doesn't have to be. You can simply put in an update. So if something changes, make sure it's in your news widget. If you have something you need your students to know, use that news widget. And students will be directed for all of their remote classes to refer to that news widget. Again, keeping that consistency and that simplicity for the students so they know where to go to get information. Uh, really at the, at the foundation of all of this is if we can connect students with their faculty, anything else can be accomplished, right? There will certainly be limitations on time, on, on technology, but if we can get that communication in place, we can always adapt from there. So we're really trying to focus on what will connect your students and you in a reliable way. And then all remote instruction courses will include a widget on the homepage with the Zoom link for your synchronous sessions and viable contact information. And if right now you are thinking there's no way I'm gonna be able to create a widget, uh, hold tight because that is scheduled for later today as well. And again, this will be recorded. So if you do have to drop off before that session or you need to refer back to it later, it will be here for you. Some additional recommendations for things to, to reflect on. Uh, these are not necessarily mandates from academic affairs, just recommendations. Uh, so consistency. Again, if you're, if you're going to have a course online, you have to use the news widget, so make use of it. Communicate everything that you need to be able to communicate that's critical to students in that news widget and do so consistently. Uh, provide clear contact information. So many students rely on being able to interact with their faculty member live. And I know when I moved to teaching online as well as face-to-face, -face, one of the biggest kind of jarring experiences for me was the amount that I relied on and that my students relied on that synchronous moment. So having clear communication information is key. That means if you're already using something in your class, like a Google voice number, keep it. Don't change that on your students. They, they know how to reach you. Stick with that. If you use your office phone right now, Jabber, which we will be providing more resources on in the near future, can help your students call your office number and you can get it on your computer if you install the Jabber app there, or on your cell phone if you install the Jabber app there, uh, smartphone only, uh, or both. You can have them both on, and that lets them reach your office phone without you having to give out your personal cell or create another number if they already look to your office to reach you. For the nav bar, we have a default nav bar that we've updated recently. You probably saw I don't know, a half dozen or a dozen emails for me on that <laughs> previously. Uh, if you do not already have a nav bar that you're using, use the default because again, it's one less thing your students will need to learn and this will be unfamiliar for them. So just trying to be mindful of that again. If you are already using a different nav bar, say you have got, you've got a blended class and you've put a lot of, of time into helping your students learn how to use that for the structure of your course, keep that. Right? It's about what's going to be best for your students, uh, what's going to be most consistent for making that transition, because this is disruptive. And again, simplicity. Uh, focus on outcomes, not on all the activities that you, that you had planned to do. Right? When, it, when I say below, this is translation, not transliteration, you're not necessarily trying to move one to one. How do I take this thing I was going to do and move that perfectly online? Uh, really kind of think underneath that layer, go back to those core outcomes and say, can this be moved online? If so, 
great. Focus on that. If not, don't, don't kind of get jammed up trying to make that a perfect experience. Think back to the outcomes and how do you help them meet those outcomes online? Uh, for a lot of this, you're probably thinking, yeah, obviously. I just wanted to put it in here so that, <laughs> that I was clear that the expectation is not to be able to execute this move one-to-one -one perfectly online. This is going to be an art and a, as much as a, a science. And then finally, empathy is key uh, for everyone. So offer your students flexibility. Uh, consider recording those Zoom sessions because again, as so many of you have already pointed out, it's probably the most immediate thing that our faculty have, have identified. Uh, our students may not always be able to get there reliably on time to engage in whatever synchronous session you are offering. So record those. Do make sure you get consent from students, uh, either by collecting it in a form, uh, like we've seen with the events that are recorded, or in the recording itself. Uh, so start recording and inform them that they are being recorded and they do have the option of dropping off. Uh, because some of our students may have understandable reasons for not wanting to participate in a recorded event. Uh, make certain that they know that they're being recorded and have that choice. And consider flexible deadlines where you can. Uh, I, I know that as faculty, at some point, we, we need to have things due, right? That's, <laughs> that's understandable. Uh, but also try to bear in mind whenever you can that student lives are going to be extremely disruptive or disrupted. And they're going to have new schedules, new responsibilities, and it's not going to just magically go away. Uh, so the fallout for this will be lingering, and we want to be mindful of that. And then also, offer yourself grace too. Uh, it's okay to be scared and uncertain. You're not expected to be able to just hop in here and make this happen. And as Cindy said, no one expects this to be a, a perfect experience. I can guarantee you it will not be. Uh, I can guarantee you in the work we've already done, it is not. <laughs> These are things where we are all trying to work through this. Uh, when in doubt, make the best call you can. You have expertise, you have wisdom, you have good hearts. Make the call that you need to make uh, and know that, that serving the students is really what this is about and you can't go too wrong with that as a guideline. And again, remind yourself that these are unprecedented times. Uh, forgive yourself when you make a mistake. And, and just try to work through and make it right as best you can. Uh, forgive your students because they will be scared and, and fear can lead to anger very, very easily. So just trying to remind ourselves, all of us, uh, to be kind, uh, I feel like Jerry Springer now, uh, be kind what, to yourselves and each other, uh, really kind of an underlying moral for this. And then finally, know that you are not alone. Uh, as Cindy pointed out. So we have remote teaching readiness resources compiled in the Faculty Resource Center. There are directions in this PowerPoint and I can make this available uh, for use outs outside of this recording as well. There's a link right there. There is a whole set of resources that Center for Design and Instruction has compiled and can make available to you. If you cannot get into that for any reason, please send me an email, let me know. We will get you in there everyone should be able to access it. Uh, all faculty should be able to access it. Today we have the rest of these sessions. So throughout the day today, we'll be covering a lot of the topics that are here right now uh, in more detail and walking you through some of these. So as I've been going through, know that the, the schedule of events for today is really based off of some of these essentials and how to get you ready as best we can. Wednesday, there will be topics workshops in that email that Cindy sent. There's a schedule for those too. Uh, so feel free to drop back in and know that there's no shame in coming back to attend a topic that we covered today. There's no shame in attending the same topic multiple times tomorrow. Uh, do what has to be done to get yourself through this. Also, virtual learning faculty have been extremely hard at work to schedule sessions of their own as well. Uh, they have great expertise in working with things like Brightspace and in many cases with Zoom. So make sure you take them up on that. That was also in the email that Cindy sent out. And then Thursday and beyond, because as of Thursday, we are no longer conducting physical operations on campus, but that doesn't mean the support ends. Uh, CDI support will continue via Zoom. So we'll have open office hours again that you can drop into and ask for help. Uh, and we'll be publishing links for that to make sure that people know how to get there. VL faculty mentors, they're ready, they're willing. 
uh, take them up on the offer. They will be continuing to work after Thursday or after Wednesday as well. Other faculty colleagues, uh, so far some of the most incredible things I've seen have come out of talking to people in your discipline, peers who have creative ideas. Uh, share what you know as you come up with solutions and don't hesitate to, to be a resource for others. Uh, again, do not be afraid to ask for help from anybody. We are in this together and, and although we will encounter moments of failure, we will also band together and encounter success as well. So that's my bit. Uh, I, I am happy to answer uh, questions for the rest of the time that I am available. Thank you, Jason. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Uh, Amy said, uh, asks, I have never used Brightspace, so my students are not used to looking for things there. Can I not continue to use what they are accustomed to instead of adding Brightspace into the mix? Well, a Amy, one thing I'll just make note of, and, and I'm going to uh, uh, give it back to Jason, uh, your students may actually be familiar with Brightspace from some of the other classes they're, they're taking, uh, potentially, so they would be already comfortable with the uh, interface. Uh, Jason, w what else might we offer Amy? Yeah, I think that's a, a great point, Joe, and really it is looking at the, the broad scale uh, so although you may not use Brightspace in your class, know that they may in others. And again, that consistency of information uh, is going to be important. So being able to communicate to students, you can go to Brightspace. We have training resources available to help them. We can direct them. We can support them. If we say you can go to Brightspace for some of your stuff, but other classes might not, that's going to be very confusing for students. That doesn't mean you can't continue to do what you're already doing. I would recommend, as you said, adding Brightspace to that. So that news widget, make use of that. We can communicate to students that they should be checking those prior to synchronous sessions, that they should be keeping up to date on that, but only if it works for their courses. Uh, if it starts to fragment, that's where communication breaks down and, and becomes chaotic and students will suffer. Okay. Next question from Bob. What kind of home internet connection do you need to conduct a Zoom class? So that, that I guess will kind of vary. Uh, generally speaking, broadband of any sort will be sufficient. Uh, so we have seen um, cell phone. Oh, wow. Well, when I hold up my cell phone, it just looks like a galaxy. Uh, there we go. Now it's bad. Well, like a magician's trick. Uh, so the, one of the, see, we've just learned one of the limitations of the virtual, uh, virtual background together. The, uh, the cell phone broadband, the LTE service does work. And, and we have had students doing zoom stuff, uh, on their phones. Uh, I have done some zoom stuff for meeting on my phone as well. So that can support it. Uh, broadband service of any type should be good enough. Zoom is not as huge a, a data hog as we might fear, uh, but it does require consistent connection, uh, maybe even more than, than powerful. So broadband of any sort, but reliable is going to be key. Uh, Joseph asks, I've installed the Jabber app on my iPhone, but phone services are not working. The app says, cannot connect to phone services. Is this something IT can fix so I can get my office phone on my cell phone? Yes, Joseph, that should be something that we can help fix. Uh, we will have resources coming out shortly on how to configure Jabber. Uh, and, and just so that nobody feels uh, a little bit odd about struggling with Jabber, I tried it the first time and I needed the same documentation <laughs> to get it set up uh, for myself as well. But I can assure you it worked very well and now I do have Jabber on my phone uh, and on my computer. Uh, Carol uh, asks, please help. My Zoom does not show the recording and the whiteboard. I'm using a, I'm using a Google Chrome. Uh, Jennifer uh, adds, Carol, if you click on the share, one of the screens that you can select to share is whiteboard. Thank you. Yes, uh, and, and know that record may also be part of the function of the meeting when you set it up. Uh, so if you're looking for the record right now and you don't see it, uh, that is not necessarily a, a surprise because you don't necessarily have access to that 
depending on the meeting settings. Uh, you may, you may not. I didn't set up this meeting. But if you are still not seeing those, I would recommend reaching out to the CDI uh, during some of the workshops tomorrow and kind of getting some, some hands-on support and we will work with you. Yeah, thanks, Jason. And Carol, uh, just to uh, add to that, uh, in the upcoming uh, segments today, uh, we'll be chatting about Zoom and actually how to uh, either uh, schedule it as to be recorded or to record it once it's started. So we'll be covering a lot more about Zoom in the coming hours. Thank you for that question. Uh, Sarah asks, would it be possible for a text to go out to students informing them to be sure to check their Hawkmail for updates for their classes? This came up yesterday in a meeting that some students are not checking in because the break was extended. So that is a fantastic idea. Uh, I will make sure that I, I communicate that back out as well. Terry asks, I use uh, a PowerPoint presentation in my lectures. How do you include it just now in your Zoom communication? Will there be instruction on this? Who can I go to for help as I attempt to include PowerPoint in my Zoom class sessions? Uh, I'll, I could take that one, Terry. Uh, Jason, while he enjoys talking, we'll let him catch his his breath just there for a minute as he circles the globe. Uh, yeah, you can, uh, you can incorporate PowerPoint into your Zoom just like we've been doing here today. And uh, we'll be demonstrating how to do some of those things in the sessions today. As well, who, do you help, who can you go to for help to include PowerPoint? You can reach out to the CDI. We've got more training coming up, of course, through today and tomorrow. But then all day Thursday, all day Friday, we're going to be available remotely via Zoom. You can reach out to one of our instructional designers, and we can help you with any of that to get you up to speed. So no worries on that. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Angela has, uh, uses the word ancient. My ancient laptop has a built-in camera, which I normally keep covered. I had it covered at the beginning of this meeting. Now that I've uncovered it, I still don't appear on the screen here. Do you have to have the camera open from the get-go in order to appear to students? So that answer will depend on a, a bunch of different possible options. Uh, it does bring up a good point that I should have included in mind. Uh, that is that tech support will also remain available Thursday and beyond, uh, also via Zoom. So Angela, what I would ask is, could you please send me uh, or Joe uh, an email, and I will actually make a note of it as soon as I'm done my portion of this, and we can talk further, and I can set you up with an, an IT help person. Uh, in theory, although this, this may vary, it should work when your camera is enabled. Uh, and if you look in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see the audio mute unmute button next to that, the stop video or start video button. Uh, if you see that button, then your camera is up and working. If you do not see that video button, then we'd wanna figure out what might be happening there. Uh, next to that video button is a little triangle uh, or like a little upward pointing carrot, I guess. If you click on that, it should give you options. And if your camera is in that list, then you should be able to turn it on from there. But if not, reach out and we will get you set up with some, some IT support to assist you further. Deb asks, can I use Screencast-O-Matic to record my lectures, PowerPoints, instead of Zoom if I link the YouTube videos on D2L? And Deb, you, you sure can use Screencast-O-Matic. It's, it's an easy tool to use, very straightforward, uh, and you could uh, certainly put those in D2L uh, if you want. Uh, just like you, you'll be able to upload your Zoom recordings in D2L if you want. So those are a couple good uh, solutions right there. And we can, again, when you're ready to decide how you want to do that, uh, CDI can certainly talk through that with you uh, later. Thank you for asking. Although just to, to touch on the word instead, just to make sure, uh, so you should still be holding synchronous Zoom sessions, but if you're not doing anything that needs to be recorded and distributed for students, you don't have to record them. So if you, you should still have the sessions at that time so that students have a way to contact you and, and ask questions and get help. Uh, but you don't need to use Zoom necessarily to record your content if you're looking for other tools. That, that can be done, as you said, and as Joe pointed out, uh, with any tool that you have available and are familiar with. 
Uh, Jason, is there an emergency plan in place if Brightspace cannot accommodate the increased activity? Will updates be uh, performed at reasonable overnight hours? So that's a good question. Uh, we should not see an issue with Brightspace because so much of that is done asynchronously and the activity should be distributed. Uh, in terms of the updates, our, our game plan is to try to not update Brightspace at all, unless absolutely necessary, uh, because it's the, the critical nature of using that for all these classes. But if we do conduct updates, we will schedule them as best we can for overnight hours uh, and for non-peak time uh, of week as well. So ideally, like really, really late on maybe a Sunday uh, might be a time that works better than, than some other options available. And uh, Jason, where will the recorded sessions from today be specifically located? So the sessions from today, uh, once we have the recording, we will process them and upload to YouTube and then be able to provide links. Uh, they will be put into the Faculty Resource Center in the Remote Teaching Readiness uh, link that Jordan had provided previously. And then we'll also make them available for academic affairs, your school deans, your department chairs, uh, so they can share them back out to you as well. And then obviously we will also have them, so you can always reach out to us uh, for them too. Yeah. Uh, I think we could combine the next two questions to a degree. Uh, is the Jabber app supposed to be the Cisco Jabber? And what does having Jabber on a computer mean? Will the computer then serve as a phone? Will it ring with incoming calls? Or is this merely a way to view slash hear a student message at a later time? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, it is Cisco Jabber, you are right. I apologize for not using the full, the full name. Uh, and I have shared my screen now. This is just my, my Jabber window on my computer. And you can see that it acts like a, a little substitute phone. So I've got, these are all my recent calls. You can see I've got that highlighted right here. Uh, calls that have come in. I have a little call button. So if I wanted to call Scott, uh, I won't right now because that would be cruel. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, if I needed to call Scott, uh, back, I can actually use this and you can see I can call his work number directly. Uh, and if he has Jabber on his computer or phone, it will ring there. Uh, and it rings kind of like if you've ever received uh, any sort of video call, like on a computer or on your phone, a little like pop up will show up saying who's calling and you'll have accept and decline, uh, just like you would on say a, a smartphone when it rings. Uh, it can go to voicemail as well. So know that if you have Jabber, but you have it not active on your computer and somebody calls you, it won't ring, but it will let them go to voicemail and they can still leave a voicemail that you can receive when you get back online. Uh, and then you can also make calls from up here. So if you need to call a student back, you can actually put their number in here, uh, up here at the top, and dial out through it as well. Thank you. Um, bum, bum, bum. Where am I here? Uh, chat decided to move me to a different location here. Um, okay, we're here. Um, right, oh, here we go, great. Uh, is, will there be training on how to install Jabber on my home PC or cell? Are there links to download Jabber on my hack? So I believe there is a link for Jabber on my hack, though I'd have to look into it. Uh, we will be providing more information on downloading and installing and configuring Jabber to support you. And we will also have the IT uh, user support folks uh, ready as well. And for those of you who are familiar with our, our help desk call service, uh, they have also been provided additional information to help people get set up with Jabber too. Great. Uh, Jason, many students on the Hack Student Facebook page posted they have not received many of the update emails from the college, although they do receive other emails. Uh, has Hack been able to correct that problem yet? I will have to pass that along. Uh, that's, that's done through other areas, but I'll make sure that I provide that feedback. Thank you. Great. 
our Wi-Fi connection is not always consistent. Any suggestions? Uh, so when you say our, I'm going to assume the, the home Wi-Fi, uh, that can be a challenge. I would recommend reaching out to your school dean if you have internet uh, connectivity concerns and, and have the conversation from there. We had an extremely limited number of uh, Wi-Fi hotspots available for faculty and staff, uh, but we can always have those conversations with academic affairs and see what can be done. Okay. Uh, at this point, I just want to say, so Jason, we've hit the 930 hour. Uh, now, I am, I'm fine with uh, taking a little bit of time from the next half hour. That's my session on uh, Zoom. If we want to continue uh, to address just a few, at least a few more of these questions, are you open to that? Yeah, absolutely. All right. And just for the audience out there, uh, I know you're, you're all tuning in at 930 to hear my awesome presentation on Zoom. Fear not. I'm going to cover that. You're going to love it. It'll be available on, uh, I think, uh, everywhere. You know, everywhere great training videos are, 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 are sold. Okay, uh, Jason. Uh, oh, I can answer this one for Mary. A Screencast-O-Matic, do I need to get my own account or is there a College Right account? Mary, actually, that, uh, there is a free version of uh, Screencast-O-Matic. It'll allow you to create, I believe, up to five minute videos, uh, which for a lot of, uh, for a lot of explanation and small lectures, that, that's actually a really good way to go. Uh, I don't, Jason, I'm not familiar if we have a, a college-wide account for Screencast. We do not currently. Uh, we okay. do have a college-wide account for Camtasia, if anybody is familiar with that. Uh, if you have a, a hack laptop, that can be installed on it. If you have a home device, you should be able to download and activate it and we can provide more information about that in the coming days. David asks, if you are using the Zoom chat and not recording video and audio, do you have to disclose the saving of the chat? Uh, I am not a legal expert, so I don't know for sure. Uh, just from my own perspective, I would recommend you can never err on the uh, too badly if you go with over-disclosing. So I would recommend telling them you will be saving the chats uh, just so that everyone is aware and has that record. Okay. Uh, Angela, Catherine is saying hello to you, so I think that's great that you two are able to connect. Dale asks, any special security issues for Zoom? That is, or for example, a susceptibility to malware? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, no, nothing, nothing special for Zoom. You may have seen uh, an article posted previously uh, if you read just the headline, it sounded like Zoom was extremely susceptible to hackers. Uh, but if you read the entirety of the article, it does actually uh, indicate that they had at one point a vulnerability that they patched. And the rest of the article was a kind of a best practice where if you have sensitive information, uh, it might not be a bad idea to put a password on the meeting, which is a function Zoom supports. Uh, if you're not discussing sensitive topics, then I'm not sure that a, a password would necessarily be something you had to look into because your students may struggle with that additional barrier in between you and them. Uh, but in terms of security, uh, the Zoom IDs are long enough that it is extremely unlikely that at any one moment in time, a hacker is going to brute force their way into your meeting. Uh, so really the password would be more if you had some need for additional security. Okay. And now just a few more uh, observations or questions regarding Jabber. Uh, and I think maybe, Jason, you addressed some of these already. Uh, I just tried to uh, load Jabber on my cell phone, but it did not work. Uh, how, uh, and now also, how do we download Jabber or obtain the software? And will I need IT permission to install Jabber on my hack-owned laptop? Yeah, so I will take all of those back and make sure that there's a communication that comes out uh, about Jabber so that we can stick to the, uh, the timelines as best we can. Great. And uh, Cindy asks, will the help desk be available 24 seven for students and faculty? Yes, the help desk will remain available and it, it will maintain the 24 seven help desk that we have right now. Okay, and someone's noting here, can we please stick to the schedule? Some of us have really tight schedules. And, and absolutely, I, I do want to uh, be mindful of that. And we, we have come down here to the end of the questions. And I just want to let everybody know, uh, later today from 
uh, 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock will be a question and answer uh, session. Jason, I hope you can join us for that if, if possible. Uh, otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'll answer, uh, CDI will answer what we can, record what we cannot, and get those answers out to you. Thanks, everybody, for those questions. They were great. And Jason, thanks so much for your time this morning. Uh, I really appreciate it. But keeping on schedule, we'll, uh, we'll be moving right along. I hope you have a safe landing as you return to Earth. And uh, we'll, we'll chat with you later. Great. Thank you again so much, everybody.